Welcome. This is a May 16th Beehive Production user call. We have Andrew, Jan, Patrick, and myself, Michael, and BSD Can is right around the corner, a week and a half or so away. Yikes. Um, so one, there's still time to register and attend. Uh, two, I'm trying to get a list of technical things going, like a build option survey for beta two, which is going through all the build options, which have been breaking right, left, and center, having gotten them working for 13. Darn it. And uh, we could always use help with small sponsorships like caffeine and travel and other little items, inclu including AV items to round out our experience there. So, hey, ask your boss, ask your friends. And there was a really good open ZFS call yesterday and jails call before that. I, I suggest you check them out. We did some really interesting exploration of say the multi-actuated drives that Stu received so patrick you have a discovery or two what's going on yes uh, i'm running the beta one of trunas 13.3 trunas core 13.3 that is based on freebsd 13.3 and besides minor glitches which are already fixed i guess i stumbled into a big showstopper for beehive which means, which is that VNC is not working for me. And I'm just running the beta since today. And I will have to investigate if that is a regression in FreeBSD 13.3 or if this is IX system's fault, which I don't know. Um, as far as I know from the source code, they really just imported FreeBSD 13.3 release and all the Beehive code with it. Um, definitely, uh, we got all uh, the nice improvements in terms of stability and uh, PCIe pass through, which are working fine. But uh, VNC for a Windows VM, I can show you just a sec. And are you trying that with or without a password SD on? At the moment, without a password. And for what it's worth, some um, VNC clients uh, no longer accept VNC without a password. Okay, so uh, you see my share screen, I hope. Uh, yeah. Um, this is this is the UI, no problem with that. This is the VNC window, and this is what happens. Oh, and one, you so. you get a picture once you refresh, hmm. but neither mouse nor keyboard works. Keyboard works sort of. Once I hit the enter key and refresh, it will probably complain that the password is wrong, right? But any key but enter will not work. And this is consistent, not only via the web VNC, but also with the VNC viewer, which I started here. Same thing. Weird. No mouse, no keyboard, no nothing. And is, does anybody know if there has been a change of configuration, startup parameters, or anything for Beehive in newer versions? I mean, the, the old version was two or three years old. They haven't touched that code base since right. previous oh. 13 dot, dot 1. So possibly there's a change in Beehive, and they just need to adjust how they call it from the middleware. Is anybody aware of a change in that area? If not, it will be. What one which is intended to break compatibility? Pardon? Jan, again, please. No, I'm not familiar. Uh, I don't know of any change which is intended to break compatibility, just that you now have a bunch of new uh, features you can make use of. And that if that you can use the uh, uh, configuration options for more things and a few things have been cleaned up. but. If you're seeing anything via VNC, there's nothing which should break that badly. But what you could try, I think there was an update to the uh, keyboard layout definition. So maybe try uh, to put everything to the uh, US uh, PC uh, keyboard layout so that it does the least amount of translation. Because if you're on a German uh, Mac OS, there uh, yeah. can be key binding issues. And okay. And uh, something else you can try is when you put in a password, 
the base system uh, macOS VNC client you can access via uh, command k vnc uh, colon slash slash IP address yep. uh, should work, but it refuses to connect to an unauthentic k to VNC. There's no password. Yeah, but this is the official VNC viewer and has worked all the time with the TrueNAS 13.1. Um, so I'm a bit puzzled. I don't even have an option to adjust the keyboard layout here. So Interesting. That's, that's definitely weird. I don't know what you can do you... on watch the two code bases as they've evolved, but go ahead, others. Go ahead and welcome. Spe specifically, my... because uh, I ran, I ran all the nightlies they had of their new trueness with Beehive on some level of free BSD stable along the lines of thirteen point two, and I installed this Windows machine via VNC and everything, mouse, keyboard, everything working, and just after the upgrade to thirteen point three now input seems to be broken uh, and did, did you notice that that uh, announcement they made for the beta uh, no. michael and like for the very first time i think in their history in the official announcement states that jails and vms are not a supportive part of true nas core oh interesting and only a best effort feature if it works it works Charming. Yep. Yeah, we already knew they gave up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, but so, quiet about it. So, for uh, just to at least catch Rod and Mark up, you found that the VNC interface to VMs Beehive on the latest TrueNAS Core beta seems to have gone south, and you can't quite log in. I I can try, of course, a Linux VM with a with a text console. Look if that works via VNC. I don't have any in production because for BSD or Linux VMs, I use the serial consoles exclusively and remove okay. the VNC device because it sucks anyway. So, are you using yeah, all but... of the Vertigo drivers? So whenever you install, yes. Like... yes. So yes, yes. did you update them to the latest ones? Or to uh, different versions in general, because maybe it's an issue with that because they updated to a different radio like transporter mechanism. Maybe it's it's the, but, I, I'm I, not clear why any of the vert IO drivers would have any consequences for a VNC console. Right. Yeah. But, seems I was, I was a good point. Beginning to argue the same. I have of course vert IO for uh, storage for networking. Okay, I was. I know that there's a lot of like there's a there's quite a few options camera all of them right at the moment. But mm -hmm. then there, if you go through the MSI Wizard on Windows, there's like twelve different drivers you can choose from. And I know I think one of them is related to either keyboards or maybe it's USB. And I thought maybe since it's passing through the keyboard stuff as a USB maybe mechanism or something, maybe that could. I don't know, but mm -hmm. maybe that's that's the only thing I was thinking of that, that path. A shot, <laughs> but yeah. Yeah, so that is that, but I'm perfectly willing to put some effort of my own into that and possibly give them a bug report, including a fix, and hope they will incorporate it. <laughs> well, a report's a good start. Um, yeah. Because yeah. They... Let's, let's, let's start with a report. Okay, the other thing to try is to actually to try different VNC clients if you haven't done that. Use real VNC, have... type VNC, and there's a third one, I think. I've they, tried the built-in web VNC and the standard VNC viewer. I have not yet tried Tiger, Tight, or whatever there is. Um, unfortunately, some of them don't work on current versions of macOS anymore. I didn't get the memo about changes in, in Apple's APIs. OK, so uh, I'll put you the announcement in the chat, Michael. Sorry, I don't have the document open myself no just worries. yet, but here's the link to the official announcement okay, from cool. my systems. Ah, understood. And my quotation is a uh, para raised. Welcome, Mark and Mark. Gary, remove, remove all the numbers at the end and you will start at the top posting. This is their new disk 
course software which ah, yes always throws you in at the bottom Well, thank you for an update from Trunaz Land. Oh, yes. Boom, boom, boom. Okay. So anyway, thank you. Let's see. Uh, Mark or Mark, any topics to share? Nothing new since my uh, question about uh, Windows just defragmenting on uh, Beehive yesterday at the ZFS meeting. But uh... Did you get to do any science on that? I mean, I turned it off and I haven't wanted to turn it back on since it's able to memory. So I haven't had a large uh, plethora of other servers to have tested on yet. So understood. I will. I have some. I just don't have the time to necessarily go through and push all the buttons on production VMs. I have to kind of plan that out. But did it uh, improve the JFS over Beehive throughput? I have not reduced the memory pressure. I have not reduced the memory in order to reduce the memory pressure. I just, ha I just don't have it running just. Optimization at the moment. I cool. wanted them to get through their indexing tasks so they can move on with this. I really want them to turn off this old VM or trying to migrate them from. So it, I'm trying to just get them done so I can move on. Uh, I well, was wondering what we're talking about on yesterday's ZFS call. We had some nice discussions about uh, Windows VMs and I think it was just clean up within the VM. So go ahead and check the reporting on that. It's disk optimized task and task scheduler, but it's the old school disk defragmenter tool under the hood. Cool. Okay. Let's see. Uh, Rodney, tell us more about Vert IONet and checksum. What have you learned? It, it, this is more of an initial probing again. Oh. Um, the uh, ran into this on another hypervisor platform um, that. Evidently, the Vertio Net um, code completely um, turns off TCP checksumming um, and UDP checksumming, so that when you you have a virtual machine that writes a packet to a Vertio Net device, that device can go to the hypervisor. The hypervisor can then hand it back to another guest without ever checksums. The packet anywhere, and that that all works great. I think we actually I don't know if Beehive is actually doing that or not. It should if it could, but um, <clears throat> the the theory being that when the packet finally does hit a, a real piece of hardware, in other words, it's going to end up on a wire somewhere, leaving that hypervisor. It will get checksummed by the NIC card on its way out because almost everybody's doing TCP checksum offloads, which that's great. Okay, so we do end up if, if the one place it all blows up is if you have virtual machines running VPNs. Oh, interesting. Because you now transport the packet out the VPN, which never hits a piece of hardware encapsulated in another mechanism. So even when even if it does traverse hardware, your unchecksum packet is encapsulated. So the hardware is not going to checksum it. And I actually ran into this because I was I had a VM that is now in this scenario where it's actually transporting packets to another VM and that other VM is now transporting those out of the box over a VPN. And um so when they get to the other end of my tunnel, they don't have any checksum on it. They still get, they're, they're just being handled by routers. Routers don't do TCP checksum on every packet. And eventually they hit the end node with a bad checksum. Um, Interesting. Yeah. And oh, so. a, a little bit of digging turned up. These the, the Linux people are going, oh yeah, yeah, you just had a, um, IP tables thing, and they, we've got this piece of code that's called fill checksum that, that basically fills in a checksum for you. And I'm kind of like, you know, I don't know if I just arbitrarily want some other box recomputing the checksum of my packets. So no. I the other workaround, and I have not tested this thoroughly, is to, to you can turn off TX... You can, I think you can turn off the offloads on Vertio Net. 
and then it should actually software compute the transmit checksums. So that should solve it. But I was wondering if anybody else has run into this and if anybody has looked closely at Beehive VertIO net output packets to see if we're actually traversing them without a checksum. I have not used our shark, but I do have a little bit of familiarity with setting the Verdeo properties on OmniOS. I have put a link in the chat here of how I got PFSense 95% working uh, within CARP mode. Uh, so basically spoofing a MAC address so they can share an IP address. And so that comes with its own things. I hadn't encountered the VPN issue, but um, these are some settings I use to disable either um, Enable the promiscuous mode or table that or uh, enable the um what you were just talking about the um hardware offloading. But um the correct solution I think is to put in uh, basically a flag bit telling you that the checksum is uh not yet computed and then move that over. And if I remember correctly, there is a field in the basically in the frame descriptors for the VitL net to tell the guest or the host, depending on the direction, uh, whether the checks are basically is valid or if it is uh, just delegated to the next one to materialize it. So I think there is a that long, that long. descriptors to move that around along. And then the, if that information is properly maintained, the system should either let the yeah. real network Handle it or compute it whenever it puts it in a VPN tunnel on the host. You would you would have to carry that flag into any arbitrary guest, and that guest would have to understand that flag, and that's just beyond yeah. scope and yeah. capability. Uh, um, it only applies, of course, if you do a packet I, or frame level encapsulation. If you are a proxy, uh, then you generate a new flow. So. It's messy. Yeah, I, I I guess the thing is, is probably mostly a documentation thing that people need to be more aware that that this occurs when you're using VertIO net, that your packets are unchecksummed and there are cases. And be be aware that TCP dump, and I'm I'm pretty sure Wireshark, Wireshark probably shows it to you no matter what. TCP dump does not report bad TCP checksums unless you run it with at least one dash V. Yeah. Are you saying that as a catch-all for all hypervisors that use Verdeo or your specific OS that I'm not sure which exactly one it is you're talking I, about? I, I am saving, I am saying this appears to be, or I believe it to be a generic VertIO net design issue that would apply to all hypervisors and all guests using VertIO net. They support leaving the checksum at zero so that you don't have to uh, yeah. go over the data tries and software. Yeah. So in OmniOS, we have two different Verdeos. We have Verdeo Net and Verdeo Viona. Do you know if, uh, I, I I think Viona was more of a legacy version. I'm not entirely sure if that's true or not. Is, do you know if it would apply to both of them? I do not because I, I, the, the v, I do know that the VT Net or VertIO Viona was a specialized thing that Giant did, I believe. Somebody did that very specifically before VertIO Net was available in um, oh. Illumos. Illumos. And then I understand. Once, no, I don't finish. One, yeah. one, one, one question. What, what is this Viona, VertIO Net dash Viona compared to just VertIO Net? I mean, I'm familiar with there is a VertIO SCSI driver, VertIO SCSI, VertIO block storage, VertIO console, VertIO Net, and I've just ever used, okay, the, okay, VertIO Net is the legacy interface. I get it. Thanks. Well, so, I, actually, I, I actually believe the VertIO Net Viona actually emulates a piece of, of hardware in the details of how it operates. Okay. And I have been running. I have been running OpenSense successfully with VertIO and Net and Beehive. It keep in mind it's an Illumos thing, just for yep. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Sorry, to... is, yeah. It, 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 poison I, pool. 
I'm almost sure that was modeled after some piece of hardware called a Viona. Um, if I understand correctly, uh, the, the Viona integration is uh, basically the tie-in for Beehive into a uh, crossbow so that you can pass through a VMIC basically with multi queue support and batching and LSO, TSO, and so on, which vastly improves network throughput. Um, Mark, in your uh, forum slash blog discussion that you had ongoing there, which you linked, um, you stated that without Virtio working, you were limited to one gigabit of throughput instead of 10 gig. Um, that was the E1000 driver limitation. Since I wasn't able to use the Virtio driver, I had to use the E1000 yeah. driver. The E1000 driver is in no way limited to one gig. Oh, that's what all Windows and all the Linux Nix said, uh, unless there's a setting I need to yes, change. Yes, of in the... course. The text, <laughs> the, the text, hey, I discovered an Intel gigabit network interface piece of hardware is hard-coded into the driver. I got to have different drivers. But the driver is. is completely virtual, so the packets will flow as fast as the virtualized driver and the hypervisor will allow. We had this discussion with VMware to no end. You boot FreeBSD in and says, hey, I have a gigabit network interface. Yes, of course, because an E1000 is a gigabit network interface, but there is no E1000. There's a piece of software that pretends to be an E1000, and this mm -hmm. thing will push packets as fast as the CPU allows. There is no limit. This is just an identifying string in the driver source code. It's hard coded. It says, hey, I found this Intel gigabit something. Okay. So because the, the, the interface is named Intel Gigabit something. So then if I had everything, if I had everything properly piped up 10 gig, I should be able to theoretically do an iperf test and get above 10 gig even though the yeah, Nick says. Possi that. Possibly you will be limited by context switches, by the fact that the hypervisor mm. has to emulate a piece of hardware that doesn't ex exist for the guest to consume a piece of hardware that does not exist, and all this overhead will limit your throughput to three gig, five gig, whatever you have, need to try and, and actually measure, but there is no fundamental one gig limit in the E1000. Hmm. That's I will reevaluate speed tests then on the PF sense. Yep. Uh, yeah, so. I've, I've run uh, the E1000 drivers on VMware on 56 gigabit and activity hardware and stuff in it it does fairly well. It won't do fifty six gigabits, but it will do significantly more than gigabit. Hmm. Depending depending on what your CPUs are. Well, the, the issue that I was having, the reason why I was why we why we weren't able to use radio is because we we're able to see other networks that were on other VLAN somehow because of the promiscuous mode in Verdeo was way too promiscuous. I don't know if there, I don't know how there's an extra level of it, but I was able to see other things in other VLANs and we, we couldn't apply it to all of our firewalls because they could see things in other VLANs. So the E1000s didn't allow us to do the car, but because you're saying, because we didn't want to use E1000 because of the speed, might be able to re evaluate being able to use that. So thank you. Yeah, the, the Verdeo net is still most likely going to significantly outperform in an E1000 emulation. But I've definitely E1000... confirmed that I've, I've, in our network. I've definitely confirmed that. Yeah. Um, um, something else. Being overly promiscuous, my guess would be that your, is your plumbing any different? Because what it can see is primarily affected by what your your v switch that you're plumbing the guest into looks like so everything it, that comes into the host is on an aggregate uh, the aggregate comes in from some i don't remember what the cisco devices are um and there there's no like there's not an ether stub or anything in between it's just the the, the ag aggregate comes in with the two ports there's your aggregate and that are aggregated into adgr0 and then that's piped in each vnic is then piped on top of the aggregate with the vlan tagging uh on the vnic so they can see no. all the VLANs. Yeah, that's it. You don't, what's your, what's your host? What's what do you mean? Host, what's the host operating system? It's uh, OmniOS. What's your platform? We're using Crossbow. So OmniOS uh, and uh, R36 right now or R30? 
Depends so that, much. Part of that sounds like to me that you whatever switch software switch that they're using in Omni OS, you don't you're not separating the VLANs in the switch. Okay. Uh, or at least whenever it's promiscuous, because whenever they're not promiscuous, they can't see other things inside of it. It's only whenever we enable the promiscuous mode in the uh, in, yeah. in, in, this, in the pr properties I put in that issue there that we can see other things in other VLANs. I can, I can uh, only describe what you what the recommended way uh, to doing this in VMware is, and this is let the hypervisor handle all the VLAN tagging and untagging yeah. and create a port group, as it's called in VMware, for each VLAN and just assign untagged interfaces to your VMs. So if you need Correct. a VM with five VLANs, it ends up with five emulated interfaces. Of course, this does not scale just as well as having real tags inside the VM's guest. So once you pass the limit that you can handle, you should essentially use PCIe pass through and let everything run through the switch and, and do the tagging in your guest OS. Um, Mark, something else to try. You don't really have to use a promiscuous mode and hack around and steal MAC addresses. Instead, you can use gratuitous app to inform everyone on the segment that, or the link, that uh, the mapping between uh, MAC address and IP address changed when you changed the uh, top uh, master. And the other thing you can do is run CARP in unicast mode so that it doesn't pollute the network with uh, multicast frames. And that's coming from more of a FreeBSD, not necessarily a PFC yeah, that's built BSD, on top of it. BSD, but the, it doesn't matter. But I would need to find um, the specific settings so I don't break our, our firewall sync gauge and stuff. So, um, yeah, the, go so ahead. The just putting a CARP into unicast mode means that every CARP, uh, int every intended node who is a potential uh, CARP master has to uh, be listed so that you unicast to each of them. But normally there are only one or two other nodes to put in every one because you are unlikely to run a dozen uh, candidates for your uh, CARP uh, instance. Apparently two. This is all that we're really exactly. trying for. So. And with regards, and then you need something to uh, send gratuitous up when you uh, change state and uh, OpenBSD you, you would use IF state D for that. In FreeBSD you can either use the ancient IF state D port which hasn't been updated in ages or uh, you can just use dev D because in FreeBSD you also get uh, notifications via the dev CTL device, which then means that dev D can consume those uh, I think there are examples in uh, slash etc by default. Just grab for a uh, carp there um, in slash etc defd or etc defaults defd or something. Um, or you uh, manually flip it over or any carp interface and uh, run a cut var run a defd dot pipe to see which messages uh, to match against. And yeah, then you need a command to act as a gratuitous app uh, notifier, which yeah. means that you send a few app packets nobody asked for telling everyone, hey, I know you didn't care, but now this is the mapping uh, for the IP address, and then they're supposed to process that and update their caches. Yeah, I'm going to have to try to find the equivalent of uh, the 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 configuration that XML that PFSense would use to be able to change it from multicast to unicast because I think that that's probably the key here and what you're saying. And the key authenticates the uh, packets. Um, what? So um, I think when you put a unicast. Uh, uh, or a, a peer address in. Um, yep. If you put a, a unicast address as peer or peer six, uh, then you get unicast behavior on FreeBSD. So look for the term peer. That was an Etsy default or an Etsy dev. 
that be uh, what was the other one? On the FreeBSD system, uh, it would be just the peer parameter to RF config. Um, but I don't know uh, how many layers of indirections PFSense and OpenSense have in between you and RF config. A lot. Exactly. What, what, and, what, what, is, what is not in the UI and in the middleware is not supported. Don't you, you have no access exactly. to free BSD uh, config file, which is the point of running an appliance OS with the UI and commercial support. Come on. <laughs> exactly. I just wanted to warn if they don't support it, don't try to mess with the config files. It's yeah, not sure. your user. Ah, okay. Yeah. Now I get your point. Sorry. Because the middleware will partially override you in time and then everything will explode and you're in a totally unsupported state and they don't even have tooling to bring you back into a, a this is everything reconfigured and the rest is undone or something like that. We just need GFS snapshots for that restore thing for that issue if we break things. But uh, no, we, we do only modify yeah. the files that the, the middleware, the basic the front end GUI uses. We don't modify anything that the back, the back, uh, the lower level stuff would need to use, so. Well, I, I suggest you, you do a throughput measurement with the E1000 driver. So there is no no hard gigabit limit. It's, it all depends on what your hardware is capable of. And try, how many VLANs do you have? Uh, per host, we'll generally do about 30 to about 60, depending on how many VMs we're putting on it. We're putting about 100 uh, VMs on a host. That's that's too much for, for handling it. But, oh, we, depending on the VMs. So yeah, the VMs. So okay, well, okay. The, the VMs are the VMs. Oh, we're, the VMs we're talking about the, the VMs. The v, I get it. We're talking about the VMs themselves. That's how they're set up. But for the firewalls, it's basically ten firewalls per host, and they have one external fire, uh, external VLAN and then one internal VLAN that then goes up to those VMs I was just talking about. I'm sorry. Oh, oh that's okay. harmless. Two so then, then don't do the tagging and NPF sense. Just create virtual interfaces and let let your hypervisor. Hyper yeah, that's how, we're, that's how we're letting the VNICs do it via crossbow. So um, that's why we're using the VNO. Having a handful of virtual NICs also helps with throughput because that means there are more mutexes to contend on. So that really, if there's a single thread throughput limit somewhere, you can hit it per interface instead of per VM if you have multiple interfaces. Okay. Well, the, the E1000 thing, I will definitely need to test that. Now we will report back on that because that will be good to know that we'll get the speed that we can actually, well, it's closer to the speed that we want and still have HA, so. Interesting. Yeah, we've given you a lot of homework this week, eh? Yeah, well, you know, I'm always, always trying to learn. Cool. Other networking topics. Well, on the subject of the E1000 thing, the vert IO should still be more efficient than the E1000 because it's not emulating a E1000, even if it doesn't actually force that gigabit speed. Yeah, absolutely. The, the, the VT net, vert IO net driver is more efficient than the E1000. No doubt. I think someone posited that we think the VertIO uh, Viona was specifically for the, for the crossbow integration on, on OmniOS or the Solaris or the Lumos systems. Is that right? I don't know if that's specific to crossbow. What I found was a couple of things. One, I found Patrick Mooney probably knows more about that Viona driver than anybody does. And unfortunately, he no longer comes to this call. Um, but the it leads me to this man page of Alumos called the Mac 9e interface, which scrolling through it, it basically looks like this framework. They call it a network device driver overview. That and they call it the Mac framework provides a means for implementing high performance network device drivers. So to me, this this Mac 9e thing looks a lot like our if lib, and that this basically is a common framework for supporting all Mac type ethernet devices. Um, and basically Viona is heavily optimized to match that so that you're, when you're transitioning from a, a guest 
um, in Beehive on Lumos to Ethernet driver stuff in the in the hypervisor kernel, you you're, you have a common format and common structures to everything and stuff. I mean, Vernio Net, if I'm not mistaken, was written and optimized to interface with the Linux kernel stack. It was not a, a generalized thing. Just like there's another one called VMX that's for VMware that's another virtualized driver. It's very efficient. Um, I actually run it on KVM on, on machines um, that was written by VMware to optimize the interface between the VM kernel and the and your guest on VMware. I mean, the source code to that one is actually available. For, for VMware VMX, that's a public source code. In fact, just no, FreeBSD doesn't. KVM has a VMX emulator. You can use it instead of Vertio Net. Hmm. And it's pretty efficient. In fact, I should go try that and see if that eliminates my checksum problem. Oh, interesting. Because I've I've run I've done what I'm doing now on Proxmox, a whole bunch on VMware, and I've never run into this problem when I tunneled packets off the box. My checksums were crap, and now that I'm migrating into this Proxmox Linux environment and stuff, and using Vertio Net, I've run into it. I'm like, what? As a user, where do you see that checksum? It's like what's the first sign of trouble? You don't ever see it as the, oh, your first sign is you can't connect to anything. Oh, well, okay, that's pretty good. <laughs> I'll tell you. Yeah, because if you have a checksum error, it's going to throw out the packet and wait, yeah. you know, yeah. and try to get yeah, another your, one. Your, your TCP send packet gets discarded. The only, way, the only way I found it was I started, I wanted to trace it down. I started running TCP dumps. I went, what do you mean my checksum's invalid? Hmm, interesting. And ended up tracing all the way back to the, Horse box and went, well, it's being emitted invalid. Why is that? And because that's the way Vert.io net works. When it tells the the guests that I have offloads and then it doesn't compute them. And arguably, I would state that that's misspecified. Uh, yeah, that sounds broken to me. But Because it doesn't work. <laughs> well, there, no, their argument is that it's fine until the packet leaves the host, the hypervisor, because then it gets computed on the outbound NIC. As well, that, the problem is, is that doesn't work for any tunnel protocol. Because if I tunnel, if I take that packet and encapsulate and tunnel it out that NIC, that NIC can't compute a checksum of an inner packet. But well, that's at the no very different. least, if you're running under a under a tunneling protocol like that, then they need to, you know whatever's doing your tunnel needs to account for that and say, hey, okay, at this point, we're going to compute it because it won't be able to be computed later. But this is no different to having a locally generated frame which has not yet computed a checksum. So if you have an MBUF uh, for a packet and you want to use it with hardware uh, transmission checksum computation, it would be the same thing. The checksum is empty, so uh, then the hardware driver would let the hardware compute it on transmit. So the, the real pro problem is that they kind of, it looks like for, lose this uh, state bit, which tells them, oh, this packet is tr trusted to be correct, but there is no checksum computed for it. So it would have to uh, basically uh, perform the delayed checksum computation. It doesn't. So there's in my no. opinion, the bug. Not that I, they I... don't compute the checksum uh, during the copying it out of the ring buffer, but that uh, they uh, then lie about having a valid checksum on the receiving end in the host and forward the zero or completely uninitialized checksum value over. It's I, it's I not have a feeling that this is that this is related to the large performance impact I see when I NAT with a virtual network driver in a VM 
And uh, if I turn off TCP checksums in the Virgo interface, everything works as expected as soon as it's turned on in the driver. So it tries to offload to some hardware which isn't there in the first place, then performance drops to almost a, a freeze. Um, so I guess I'll have to revisit that ticket that I gave Christoph Provost about that. Uh, maybe, maybe it's all not entirely anyone's fault, but just the a false assumption on the part of, of Virtio that some later stage, preferably hardware, will always be able to do the checksum, which for many scenarios in virtualization just isn't true. So thank you very much for pointing that out. Welcome. I just my that's my feeling on it is there's a big piece. There should be a big giant warning page in, in the Vertio Net driver. This driver does not actually compute the checksums. <laughs> oh, it, it does if you switch off offloading, doesn't it? I'm not positive of that. Okay, we have at, at least in FreeBSD. I mean, in the in the FreeBSD guest. I Yeah, I think Jan's digging out the pieces of relative documentation. Anyway, it's it was you know it was a rather surprising find, and I don't think it's very well documented. Yeah. Um, the one the piece which could be a problem is that uh, Linux has something and which ZIO can pass through, which FreeBSD does not support, and that is GSO in addition to TSO and uh, LRO, yeah. which is basically generic segment offloading. Uh, which can basically um, lazily do the segmentation of other protocols than TCP so that you get the advantage of batching until you hit real hardware. It's maybe a bit much uh, text to uh, go through in this call. Understood. Well, interesting. Uh, well, <laughs> great find. Goodness. And I can totally see how, you know, there's that assumption that you're always hitting hardware and, you know, not my but problem. If you didn't, uh, the in this case, Linux kernel in uh, in Proxmox should notice that it has a, what is that terminology, SK buff uh, with the packet and no valid checksum for it. So it should compute it before it sends along the packet. Sure, I mean that there were interfaces without offloading capability mm -hmm. and there must be some ca capability flag or something in, in any given piece of hardware that tells the driver what the hardware can do. Or, or is this just hard coded in, in every particular driver because we just know the models and, the, and their specifications? Or if the driver, if you're on hardware that didn't specifically uh, support as, as the, off does, load, does, does the driver the stand driver a chance could to do ask, the yeah. does computation? Does the driver stand a chance to ask the hardware what it is capable of? Or is this just hard-coded because we know an Intel gigabit can do this and an Intel X something can do this and a Broadcom can do this. Depends on the driver. Some drivers uh -huh. you get feature flex you can probe and for others you just have to infer from the vendor and product ID that it's this type of hardware and it always can do that. Okay. There's a limit to how much you have to enumerate and how much you just infer from is this type of chip or it's a PCI device with this vendor and product ID. So the driver mm. attaches and then the driver trusts the hardware yeah, to sure. behave as if 
it was the thing it's pretending to be. Mm -hmm. um, so for uh, bigger families of chips, which evolved over time, it's quite likely that you have a feature flag somewhere to check. Uh, the, the different capabilities of related um, chips. But if you have a, I don't know, a Melanox 100 gig card, you wouldn't expect it to, to ever come without GCP uh, checksum computation offloading. So there's probably not a bit to test if the chip supports it. It's just a bit to check if it's enabled or not. Would it be helpful to make a list of things to test? Or is it clear in the doc and your napkin notes? Well, if there's a big performance culture, it's first worth documenting and second, um, learning more about if there is a better configuration. Because it could also be that if you just make use of this offloading, something better because performance may be suboptimal, but it should not drop off a cliff like uh, Patrick described. So just enable if it truly drops off the cliff uh, and if you enable checksum offloading, it's probably either most of the traffic gets discarded somewhere or it runs into the next layer of supposed offloading, which is incompatible with that. The common way to uh, shoot yourself in the foot there would be to have LRO or TSO on a bridge interface in FreeBSD. Um, because then basically, anytime you reach a packet rate to trigger the LRO TSO uh, segment merging or splitting behavior, um, instead you get an inverted one, you discard it until the retransmits are a space so far uh, apart that the hardware does not offload them anymore. So basically anytime you have a burst of throughput, the connection hangs until the congestion control considers this such a terribly slow connection that it packet pacing is slower than the minimum rate to trigger the offloading. <laughs> and that feels really like uh, yeah. The, the You're perfect, busy, the perfectly at the edge of the Wi-Fi reachability, here. it's like you have to have several milliseconds between each packet. Thank you for putting in an issue. There's your ticket. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's uh, applicable to to NAT and bad throughput, not. Uh, VPN or anything, but I think this is fundamentally the same, might fundamentally be the same problem. So a uh, zero point something megabit sounds like this could be the issue. Um, I, I didn't know that there is a rate below which uh, so, the driver will not use offloading anymore. That no, sounds so the issue is that to do a TSO, the driver has to buffer the uh, frame and wait for new segments from the same TCP flow to uh, merge in with that or in the other direction split up. And here the problem is you don't want to delay too long. So basically the, the moment you have something uh, in your queue, you start a short timeout and then the yeah. timeout expires the, the un uh, batch frame gets forwarded so you have, you have a limit on how much uh, basically per hop delay you add by waiting for an opportunity to batch stuff i'll and... i'll try to, to to reproduce it in in beehive i guess in my local system where i have the option of changing the emulated network hardware so i can compare e1000 and, and virtio but so I guess Christoph is right. There is probably no bug in PF specific to the scenario, but it's just the, no. the entire setup. And what unfortunately, with, with, that, with, with, that, with that cloud provider, I don't have the option of changing the network interface. Yes, yeah. Okay. Can you share the IF config output with us from the uh, system where you reported the bug on? Just right now? Yes, of course. Which uh, basically the probably the first two of three lines are the most interesting one. 
So what again, please? I have config and what heads. I have config. Uh, and yes, yeah, maybe you are. But there's really config. No, and just for the I have config, mask out with some kind of asterisk or whatever, what you don't want to share. And the other part would be the IF config settings in rc.com, which offloading features you have disabled. Then no, no problem of sharing a public IP address. I mean, it gets scanned 24 um, times seven anyway. <laughs> People in, in firewall bulletin boards make so much fuss about their internal network structure. Oh, I edited yeah, out I the RFD 1918 addresses. Yeah. These are not security relevant. If they are, you're already screwed. <laughs> yeah, but there are commands you really shouldn't uh, share the output of, like WG uh, showconf or something. Yes, 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 of course. <laughs> no private keys. So, exactly. Um... Okay, so this is currently. Yeah. The current config without anything disabled, but as recommended in the issue, I have in sysctl.conf, I guess, or is that in loader.conf? Yes. Uh, it would be a good loader.conf. I have this one oh, in loader.conf. Wait, in loader.conf? Yeah. You put your IF config lines in loader.conf. No, 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 no. The, the last one. Hardware VTNet checks and disable. Oh, um, yep. The question yeah. is what? And, and, and this makes it fast again. So this was the alternative way okay. of just disabling uh, checks and offloading. Yeah, OK. So uh, you're ha having like, issues with, the, with their hypervisor stack yep. underneath your virtual machine. I'm wondering. Okay. I'm wondering if the, the difference there is whether you're computing the checksum in the guest or the host, the hypervisor. It is. This HWVTNet dot some some underbar disable. You actually end up calculating the checksum in the host, in the hypervisor. You do. And Same as it, a VTNet. Oh. Yeah. And yeah. Okay. It's the same as if you uh, disable the check summing with the IF config line you provided in your issue, disabled RX checksum, TX checksum for IPv4 and IPv6. No. I'll, um, I'll, just, I'll just fetch the original IF config without that loader.conf entry so you can see which features the, the emulated hardware is supposed to offer. And and yes, Rod, I'm using this for a VPN to, to circumvent geo-blocking. I just have a single $5 per month virtual machine in the US for reasons, you know, and then I use WireGuard to connect and the host doesn't stand a chance of doing any checksumming at all. So quick I question. I have to step away. Okay, um, no worries. I will talk to you guys later. Andrew, take care. And mm -hmm. just quick question, this uh, syscontrol effect pushes the checksumming to the host, to the best guest or off on either one? Um. The guest thinks it pushes the checksumming to some hardware, and okay. this hardware must be provided by the hypervisor host in some virtualized hypervisor thingy kind of way, of course. Got it. And a naive question here. Are there any CPU feature flags that specifically assist with the offload, which I'm guessing is held, handled by an ASIC and on NIC, but for virtual environments, is there anything to... There is no hardware because it? the checksum is so simple. It's just a, a basically a once complement sum. So uh, it's just adding up the 16-bit uh, uh, half words okay. uh, in the packet uh, and shifting around. So that it's so trivial, uh, which is also why uh, the hardware offloading for it is so old and common. The next problem would be when you move the frames around that, yeah, and bridge it, uh, you have to provide valid Ethernet checksums, but that's also always okay, done by so the Okay, so Jan, this is what you get I... when you don't disable hardware offloading. 
So this is what the driver this is what the driver thinks it has got in terms of hardware support. Mm -hmm. And that with that, decent, con with, with that configuration, performance is just abysmal, right? Um, for WireGuard. For WireGuard. For WireGuard, not for traffic that originates in the VM, but the only purpose of this VM is the WireGuard gateway. That's interesting because um, WireGuard should just generate. Um, what's the MTU of a WireGuard interface? 1420, small enough. Okay. Um, so you're not. Hmm, oh, well, there could, there could be an issue. Do tell. Well, his his VTNet interface is configured with an MTU of 1500, and he's then going to push those packets into WireGuard. What does WireGuard use? No, no, my WireGuard. That's WireGuard. in 80 bytes of overhead. It fits. Yeah, my WireGuard interface has got an MTU of 1420. As soon as I disable hardware offloading, all of this works blindingly fast. Yeah, we got to be careful about what we say when we say disabling hardware offloading, because I think actually what happens when you set hwvtnet.csum underbar disable. From my read of the man page, and I think your output that you're showing with your VT net device there is actually yes. is what it does is it disables the appearance of checksum offloading, which then pushes the checksumming into the guest. Yes, yes. of course. Yes, sure. That's the point. Uh, okay. Above, somebody said it pushes the checksumming to hardware on the host. It does not. It no, pushes no, no, no. the software the guest. to the guest. The guest thinks it can offload the checksumming to some hardware, and if the traffic is encrypted and there is no TCP in place on the outermost frame, in the outermost frame, then it plain doesn't work. So just a sec. Um, that's incorrect. The T in T is for TX, not for TCP. Uh, uh, so okay, there's right. a UDP right, packet, right, right. and the right. UDP packet has a header checksum. Right, sure. And I so in, because of that so that's the strange oh, no, part. The encapsulated traffic should not hit that. Mm -hmm. The no. UDP packets from WireGuard shouldn't be different from other UDP tra uh, packets. That's the confusing part uh, for me because either everything should be terrible slow or WireGuard shouldn't be a special case. Be so this is this is what I this is what I do when I did not use this rc.conf setting the CSAM disable. The yeah, CSAM disable is according to to Christoph the equivalent of the dash rx CSAM take CSAM etc. Yeah. So that's that's this part. With these four flags set in IF config, everything's fast, and. The part well, that is slow, you are you're right. This is not this is not strictly related to WireGuard and the encryption, but in my case, it's related to NAT, because the host the hosting company gives me only a single IPv4 and a single IPv6 address, so I oh. NAT the tunnel traffic once it's decapsulated to the host's address to reach the internet. And okay. when I do that, the traffic is slow as soon as hardware offloading is enabled in the driver. Um, I think the checksumming is innocent in your case. Okay. Because the difference between your two IF configs is that um, you have TSO visible there and LRO. And those are the culprits which are incompatible uh, with free, how basically FreeBSD does not, because to do not correctly, the uh, packet rewriting code has to see the original packets. But if LRO or TSO are in operation, what the network stack gets is the rewritten segments, like up to 32 or 68 kilo, uh, 64 kilobyte large segments and okay. then it performs not on that tries to send that down and the then the frame is larger than the maximum mtu and it gets dropped and then it gets retransmitted and you have the same behavior that the hello mm -hmm. so what i would try in your case is um comment out the see some uh, disable yep. in loader code 
Just disable reboot. TSO and LRO and try again. I will and do. in all variations, including the uh, per VLAN one. Yep. And then you should get uh, the performance. Are you using PF or IPFW or even IPF? IPF. PF. I'm a, I'm originally okay. when working with stock FreeBSD instead of a particular product. I was a big fan of IPFW, but it don't do uh, six to six NAT, which I need in this case. Mm -hmm. So it's all PF. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> what? Whoa! You're running six and six. Yeah. Okay, sorry, but this was completely off topic. <laughs> yeah, <never laughs> but thank you very much, Jan. I will investigate in that direction. So, yeah. Because your behavior matches exactly what I've seen before with LROTSO. Yeah. And none of that is checksumming related. Yeah. But what's happening is that you aggregate up a giant imaginary ethernet frame and then try to uh, send that out and the driver will just say sorry this hardware can't even if it's just virtualized can't uh, transmit a 32 or 64 kilobyte segment and just drops it chris you have quite a bit to catch up on and we did talk about performance benchmarking of say E1000 versus uh, VertIO net. So you may just want to either check that in the minutes or the recording when it comes out. Sure, we'll do. And Jan, Actually, I've that... got a Please. question for some of you, maybe um, if you have an answer, I don't know. Um, I got, um, actually I got a news bit and I've got a question. So basically let me start quickly jumping with the news bit. There is plans for an enterprise working group next week. Um, I don't have the particular date yet, but um, it looks like either Mondays, Tuesdays, Thursdays, or Fridays um, around, uh, let me think, uh, 10 to 11 Eastern, I think. That's that's kind of the uh, the time frame that we're looking at. Uh, Greg sent me a couple of dates and uh, time suggestions, but he has not sent it out on a newslet, on a newslet, uh, on a News and an email uh, list, yep. Um, and the question that I have is, Greg pointed to me to a recent podcast they run Oxide, and they have uh, developed something called, I don't know if you've heard about it, Propolis, which is a Beehive Virtual Machine Manager, and it has implemented uh, life migration. And apparently in Illumos, there is life migration code that supposedly works on AMD as well as Intel. And I was wondering if any of, if any one of you guys have tried that, looked at that, and what your take is, whether that is possible to port to FreeBSD or maybe there's such a divergence, I don't know. But I was just looking at that right now and it looks like, um, at least from what I see, there's headers imported from FreeBSD into Illumos. So it's actually going the, the opposite direction, but I have not um, really dug deep yet. Can you link that? Um, you want a link? Hold on a second. Yes, I do have a link. Um, that should be Oxide and Friends, and I believe yes, it's exactly. Rust based for what it's worth. It's their own. Yes, front end exactly. Yep. If Amir's... I understand correctly, they uh, basically wrote their own replacement for the Beehive user space uh, code. Yes, uh, in Rust like uh, on all of that, and then extended VMM to add uh, device pass through uh, and live migration. But uh, even there, you can only pass through power virtualized drivers if you want live migration. So because it's meaningless to have live migration to another host when you pass through physical hardware. Yeah, then you can't, obviously. <laughs> because you can't in sync live migrate physical hardware. I have yet to see a robot unplugging PCI cards and plugging it into the other system while the VM is migrating. <laughs> I can I can envision a world where we might have the exact same piece of hardware in the other box and exactly configured into the same switch. So I could actually have a pass-through PCI NIC card that migrated with the VM in a very controlled scenario. I would, I would consider reserve that the power device. virtualized. 
because you would just have a very thin glue driver in between the virtual functions to do the to tie in the state and synchronize it, but you would still have a piece of software in between there. It's just that normally it's out of your fast path, which would be really neat if they get that working. And the other part is with uh, things like NVMe over Fabrics or uh, potentially uh, non-transparent uh, PCI bridges, you could also do uh, unholy things. Of uh, Yeah, the virtual machine is running there, but it's a uh, SCSI card is over there. <laughs> So that you disaggregate your hardware. <laughs> but that's mostly sensible thinking, which IBM writes uh, marketing papers about. Chris, anything else? Um, well, there's some some preliminary news around VM state D. I've uh, <laughs> I've started what Jan kind of you know <laughs> pushed me to do. Um, I'm working on uh, uh, connecting Beehive to a PTY uh, console. I've got much of the code already working, actually. I've got um, the virtual console set up working. I've got sockets that connect to that. It's built to also allow um, multiple clients to connect one on a right on a regular file Unix level socket and also on a TCP IP socket. Um, the code is generic enough to actually allow, let's say, connections over the network. And um, I'm just, you know, working out the glue at the moment and building additional test cases to verify that it is actually working before I put the whole thing in. Oh. Other topics and questions and all. Not from my side at the moment. Oh, others, others. Well, here's my uh, massive fresh documentation that was previously just in an outbox. I did an emergency Windows Server 2016 uh, VM that was already on Hyper-V uh, migration to Beehive. And I made some notes mostly so I don't like completely forget and some of it was just preparation, like document a few things, maybe add those vert IO drivers in advance, enable this uh, the out of band console for Windows, the SAC, which is useful because it shows up in Beehive as a serial console device, and you can do shutdown and other stuff, especially you can even jump into PowerShell, which is nice. And then I just uh, went through the steps and it's working and I am delighted and users didn't notice or care. So that's my metric of success. I absolutely welcome input from you on what could be done better. And uh, I don't know if such a simple case study should go in say the wiki or what, but hey, if you have to do this or pretty much any Windows server migration, these steps might be useful. And I'm sure Andrew who had to leave, but Mark, you might have some clever added steps from the field. Uh, for the Windows 2016 thing here? Yep. Just... Uh, sorry, I was reading something else. Uh, no worries at all. So I just right? thought, hey, preserve the MAC address cleverly just so that it hopefully complains about the... Du arbeitest mit AWS Cloud? Ja, sorry. Sorry. Windows Server 2016 Beehive migration if you have access. Anyway, so I do have a wiki on doing this. However, oh, what I do is—is um, is that public yeah, or just it's, no? It's company. it's an internal wiki. But oh. um, all that I do is is I boot it up via Beehive, attach to the Windows ISO, the Virtio ISO. Um, if it's a an MBR disk, I then use GPT to MBR tool to convert it to MBR. The uh, Microsoft one or something like Aomi. I use the Microsoft tools. Oh, cool! Uh, Great. Yeah, I don't. I don't pay for anything. We're already paying for Microsoft enough as it is. Why should we use any external tools? So anyway, um, their tools suck, but besides the point, they're still available. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, sorry, bias against Windows. But uh, yeah, I use the Windows ISO, basically boot into recovery tools. I use the MBR2 GPT tool. And then after that, I 
uh, install the vertio drivers by doing uh, what was the command driver load e vertio the path to the uh, net kvm net via via SCSI and net via store drivers that then gives me access to the disks that I can then see once so I can see them then I can uh, inject the drivers using DISM commands and once I have business commands done um, I turn off the VM and then change the from BIOS to EFI and if it wasn't EFI and it should be ready to go on Beehive on Illuma and on uh, B, on, on BNC on Illumos. Nice. Oh, you said BISM command? ISM. Yeah, it's a, here, I'll put an example from memory. Yeah, if you can drop anything in, great. Appreciate it. slash image. Properties. Okay. BISM, thank you. Mm. Uh, yeah, for what it's worth, if if that's shareable, I welcome your your input. I went pretty hands off and went with NVMe and just kept it crazy simple and yeah, uh, that small usually as possible. For that. And yeah, uh, here's the number one factor. Even before converting, just drop it on a data set and start snapshotting that, or a Zvol and just snapshot it at every little step there. So you can say, oops, I got the wrong driver. Roll right back. Oops, oops, oops. Yeah, so ZFS is your friend. So anything else at this time or shall we call it? And... There is a polis link. Thank you for that. Oh, good man. Thank you for that syntax. Be something like that. It might be a little off, but it should be pretty close. Yeah, but... no, awesome. What? Just knowing that it can be done is helpful. Very cool. Anything else? Or it is, let's see, time to see. About 1820 UTC. Oh, nice. I will keep these links coming. Great work. Michael, Great do you work. happen to know if DTrace is available on TrueNAS Core? That is a very good question. Uh, why would they disable it? <laughs> it yeah. is, but you're not supposed to install packages like the DTrace toolkit. Yeah, I, I would just need to detrace every invocation of the exec system call to find out how the middleware actually calls Beehive um, in the investigation they... of, the, of the mouse, etc. issue. So I can reproduce it on plain free BSD 1303. So yeah. just try to run dwatch uh, x exec ve. Uh... If it doesn't work, they, they, try they, to they, load they, the DTS yep. kernel module. Uh, Dwatch is there. God bless Devin. Ah, and, it's uh, in the <laughs> so That's good to know. Yeah. Yep. And uh, it used to be that their own kind of graphing stuff used Dtrace for something, so it was already loaded. Yeah. In, older, yeah, it's, in it's some all there. I just, I just tried. Which Dtrace? Okay, nice. They were relevant. Question is, uh, did they break anything? But yeah. Cool. Well, end of life after. Ah, uh, is it? Yes. So D watch is in. Oh yeah, it is. There. Okay, great, awesome. Anything else? We are how many after eighteen? Well, Chris, do you want to do the honors? Like and subscribe. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Take care. <laughs> Bye, everyone. See you. Have a good night. Thank you.